Hi everyone! While reading the latest news, I noticed that many companies are starting to make more efficient and cheaper space rockets. Some of them can even return to the ground and deliver cargo to orbit for less than $100 a kilogram. Huh. I wonder how this became possible, and what development rocket engines have undergone over the last century, from the most dangerous to the most efficient ones. Well, let's figure it out. Mankind has been familiar with jet thrust since the ancient times, when people first saw some sea creatures, for example, like common jellyfish or squid, throwing out a jet of water in the opposite direction from the way they were moving. Later, about 1200 years ago in China, someone tried to make a new medicine out of potassium nitrate, sulfur, and charcoal residue. After grinding the ingredients, they accidentally produced a highly flammable mixture, namely black powder. When conducting experiments with it, scientists of that time noticed that it could burn rapidly and produce a large amount of smoke and gaseous products. When the gunpowder was placed in a confined space, the bursting gases could create a primitive thrust, which became the ancestor of modern rocket engines. The advantage of smoky powder is that it can be easily used to make simple, solid propellant rocket engines, such as the one used in these fireworks. The only thing you need to do is to make a primitive nozzle, and the escaping gases will easily lift the charge to an impressive height, which can not only explode spectacularly in the air, but even scare away some enemies. It's an interesting fact that people in many places on Earth have been making primitive multiple launch rocket systems using black powder since the 15th century. They were extremely successful in repelling enemy attacks in China and India. In this field, black powder remained unchanged for hundreds of years, and was the only propellant in many wars, up to World War II, when it was used in early Soviet grenade launchers and some mortars. But still, the black powder has several significant drawbacks. It's characterized by low efficiency and a large amount of smoke and solid particles produced during combustion. Therefore, since the beginning of the 20th century, it's been replaced by other compounds. For example, based on nitrocellulose, which can be easily obtained from ordinary cotton wool by exposing it to sulfuric and nitric acids. Nitrocellulose itself practically doesn't produce any smoke and burns very quickly, so it can be safely set on fire even on the bare hand. However, you shouldn't do it without professional supervision, because sometimes low-quality nitrocellulose can burn for too long and may hurt your hand. By mixing such nitrocellulose with nitroglycerin in some solvents, it's possible to obtain cordite, a so-called smokeless powder, which burns without producing solid products and is perfectly suitable for creating smokeless rocket engines. For example, the RPG-7 uses a booster with nitroglycerin powder. However, this type of gunpowder is quite expensive and can't be stored for a long time, which is why large solid propellant rockets commonly use cheaper and simpler rocket fuel compositions, such as the simplest rocket fuel consisting of potassium nitrate and sugar. In my case, I replaced sugar with xylitol to lower the melting point of the mixture. I weighed the required amount of nitrate and xylitol, which can't be written here, and then fuse them in a pan heated on an electric stove. You mustn't use a gas stove in this mixture, as it can easily ignite from an open flame. Moreover, it is preferable to stir the mixture with a plastic spoon to avoid any random sparks. Once the fuel has cooled down and solidified, we can check its combustion properties. As you can see, it burns rapidly and produces a lot of gases, so it can be easily used to create homemade rockets. Yeah, this fuel burns very well, but still, from the physical point of view, it's not perfect, because its specific impulse per unit of mass is relatively low, as the amount of gases produced during its combustion is not so high. The reason for this is potassium nitrate, which contains little oxygen in its molecule and can't turn the above-mentioned xylitol into a gas quickly enough. That's why modern solid propellant rocket engines use fuel with more efficient oxidizers, for example, based on perchlorates. For this test, I decided to make a fuel using potassium perchlorate as an oxidizer and construction silicone as a binding agent and fuel at the same time. After mixing these two components, we obtain a vicious substance that can be molded into any shape until the silicon hardens. I left a hardened piece of such fuel for testing, after which I set it on fire. As you can see, such rocket fuel burns no worse than rocket candy. 
and it also is much more efficient. This rocket fuel can be pressed into a paper tube, leaving a channel for more efficient combustion, thus obtaining a primitive solid propellant rocket engine. After drying, the engine can be started with an electric ignition. As you can see, this engine generates a very powerful thrust capable of lifting not only the rocket, but also the payload into the higher layers of the atmosphere even without a nozzle. But still, no matter how efficient a solid propellant rocket engine is, it always has one significant disadvantage, the impossibility of adjusting its impulse, as well as the impossibility of shutting down the engine in case of malfunction. This is what happened to the shuttle Challenger. Even though the technical failure was detected, it was impossible to turn off the solid propellant thrusters and they exploded, taking the lives of eight crew members. In order to avoid such situations, the Soviet Union began developing the very first hybrid propellant rocket engines as early as the 30s of the 20th century. To demonstrate the operation of a primitive engine of this type, we can make a simple structure out of a culinary siphon and ordinary pasta. To begin with, I fill the siphon with nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas, which is a rather strong oxidizing agent and can be used for foaming cream. After that, I gradually let the nitrous oxide out of the siphon, passing it through an ordinary burning macaroni. In this case, the inner part of the macaroni immediately ignites and under the influence of increasing nitrous oxide, supply even creates a slight thrust, thus acting like a hybrid propellant rocket engine, where pasta dough serves as the fuel and nitrous oxide as the oxidizer. Of course, this experiment is interesting, but unfortunately, we can't see what's going on inside such an edible jet engine. So, for further experiments, I decided to make a more substantial demonstration model of a hybrid propellant rocket engine using a large acrylic rod. To start, I drilled a through channel in it and threaded one of its sides. After that, I asked a lathe operator to make a steel nozzle, which would compress the gases coming out of the engine, thus creating a more powerful thrust. Now, using epoxy resin, I glue the nozzle to the engine and wait for it to solidify. That took a whole day. After which, I screwed in a fitting on the other side to connect the oxygen supply line. And that's basically it. The hybrid jet engine model is ready. When everything was ready to start, I went outside and connected my rocket engine to the oxygen tank and attached it to a heavy weight so that it wouldn't fly away during the tests. Starting such an engine is quite easy. I simply overturn the oxygen supply and ignite the engine from the inside with a long match stick. Once the inner channel is lit, you can increase the oxygen supply. The convenience of an engine like this is that its thrust can be easily adjusted by varying the oxygen supply. It's also worth noting that the thrust of an engine like this gradually increased over time as the inner channel burned out, but I didn't risk powering it to the maximum because of the danger of overheating the acrylic body. After all, this is only a demonstration model, not a functional prototype. In the 1950s, though, the early designs of these engines used a similar construction, with a polyethylene rod as the fuel and concentrated hydrogen peroxide as the oxidizer. In fact, such hybrid engines can use absolutely anything as fuel. There's an interesting episode of Mythbusters where they attempted to make a rocket engine out of a salami stick, but apparently they made a mistake in their calculations and the engine failed to fly properly. Nevertheless, such engines, despite being considerably safer than solid propellant engines, have found little commercial use due to poor mixing of fuel with oxidizer, the constant need to adjust the oxidizer supply, and also lower efficiency compared to solid or liquid propellant engines. Finally, we've gotten to the most interesting and efficient engines at the present day, namely liquid propellant engines. They were developed at the beginning of the 20th century, both in the USSR and in other countries. The distinguishing feature from the other types of rocket engines is that the fuel and oxidizer are injected into the combustion chamber in liquid form, after which they react with each other, creating a powerful propulsion, which is much easier to control compared to a solid propellant or hybrid rocket engine. One of the most commonly used oxidizers in these types of engines is liquid oxygen. 
which can be obtained by passing ordinary oxygen from a cylinder through a copper tube cooled with liquid nitrogen. In appearance, liquid oxygen is a blue-colored, extremely cold liquid, which can be mixed with kerosene, liquid hydrogen, methane, and other combustibles in a rocket engine. However, it is incredibly difficult and dangerous to create even the simplest model of such an engine, as liquid oxygen mixed with combustibles can turn anything into an ordinary bomb. Therefore, I decided to make a model of an engine with a milder oxidizer, concentrated nitric acid. Nitric acid is usually sold in concentrations not exceeding 65%, as this is the maximum concentration that can be obtained by ordinary distillation. It easily dissolves some metals, such as copper, even in this concentration, but it can't set anything on fire as it contains too much water. To get more concentrated nitric acid, it must be displaced from its salts, for example, with the help of concentrated sulfuric acid. For my experiment, I took potassium nitrate and poured 96% sulfuric acid over it. The reaction starts immediately after adding the sulfuric acid, even at room temperature, forming concentrated nitric acid and solid potassium bisulfate. Still, this process is too slow in these conditions. To speed it up, I heat the mixture and also connect the flask to a distillation apparatus, separating the resulting nitric acid from the sulfuric acid and other obtained impurities. After heating the mixture, it begins to boil and produce nitric acid vapor with a concentration of at least 95%, which condenses into a yellowish liquid. The resulting acid of this high concentration can burn through various materials and may even spontaneously ignite them, as in the case of these latex gloves. Since the concentrated nitric acid sets latex on fire so well, is it possible to produce rocket fuel by mixing it with something liquid and flammable? To test this theory, I decided to mix nitric acid with aniline, a rather commonly used combustible reagent in the organic synthesis laboratory. First, I added a small amount of concentrated nitric acid to a test tube, and then poured a drop of aniline into it. The aniline began to blacken under the influence of nitric acid, forming the well-known dye called aniline black. At this point, the reaction stopped without further ignition or any particularly violent effect, although another chemist from the Nile Red channel had a much more active reaction. Perhaps my nitric acid wasn't that concentrated, or maybe it had absorbed moisture from the air over a few days of storage. Therefore, I thought that since this experience with nitric acid failed, I should try to create something more similar to a real liquid rocket propellant mixture. Based on amyl, or nitrogen tetroxide, this oxide is obtained by cooling nitrogen dioxide, which in turn can be obtained by reacting ordinary 65% nitric acid with metallic copper. For my next experiment, I added quite a lot of copper pieces to the flask with nitric acid, which caused a reaction producing nitrogen dioxide. Apparently, I used too much copper for this reaction, which made it too violent, and so far I couldn't collect the resulting gas. After cooling the flask with water, the reaction slowed down a bit. Also, I decided to transfer the gas through a tube to another flask cooled with ice water to collect it more efficiently. The thing is that nitrogen dioxide cooled under 21 degrees Celsius turns into its dimer, nitrogen tetroxide, which is a semi-transparent light liquid used in some types of rocket engines as an oxidizer. To be more precise, such engines can be found on proton rockets, which have been used by the USSR and Russia since the 1960s. Eventually, a dark blue liquid began to collect in the flask, which is in fact a mixture of tetroxide and nitrogen 3 oxide. However, the amount of the resulting nitrogen oxide mixture was insufficient, as most of the nitrogen dioxide simply evaporated instead of condensing in the flask. Well, I can hardly make a rocket engine with this amount of fuel. We need to come up with a more efficient method. The next day, I decided to cool the resulting nitrogen dioxide with dry ice, which has a temperature of minus 79 degrees Celsius. In order to cool it more efficiently and evenly, I decided to use a liquid with high heat capacity, such as pure ethanol, to which I gradually added pieces of dry ice until the liquid cooled to sub-zero temperatures. Since I added dry ice to ethanol at room temperature, it began to sublimate rapidly. 
In other words, it went from a solid state right to gas. As a result, excessive amounts of carbon dioxide easily splashed the ethanol out of the beaker. So, to cool the alcohol more smoothly, I poured out some of the ethanol and gradually added dry ice to the remaining liquid in the beaker. The ethanol cooled down quite quickly and reached a minimum temperature of minus 36 degrees Celsius. When the beaker was filled with cold alcohol, I dipped a test tube into it. This tube would accumulate the nitrogen dioxide produced with the help of copper and nitric acid as before. This time, I took into account the previous mistakes and decided to add small portions of nitric acid to the copper pieces to avoid excessively violent reaction and boiling of the reaction mixture. The resulting nitrogen dioxide flows into a test tube cooled with alcohol and dry ice. There, it quickly condenses into a dark blue liquid consisting of a mixture of nitrogen free oxide and nitrogen tetroxide. In other words, amyl, which was a secret component of the Soviet rocket fuel back then. To prevent the glass with cold alcohol from frosting, I constantly spray it with pure alcohol, which over time accumulated in a small tray. I decided to accumulate more liquid mixture of these oxides for my experiments, for which I gradually poured portions of nitric acid into the flask with pieces of copper. After about an hour, I had enough liquid nitrogen oxide mixture in the test tube, so I could try to make a model of a real liquid propellant rocket engine. For this purpose, I first poured a little nitrogen oxides into the test tube, which easily evaporated when heated, immediately filling the tube with vapors of brown nitrogen oxide. To simulate the operation of a rocket engine, I added a few drops of aniline as fuel to the test tube. As you can see, the reaction didn't take long and the mixture of these substances even created a small thrust during combustion. I wonder if it'll become stronger if I make a small constriction in the tube. Yes, in general, it slightly improved the combustion of the mixture. But still, since aniline molecules contain a great deal of carbon atoms, such a mixture burns with the formation of carbon monoxide and soot, which is not quite effective. Besides, such a mixture of substances was hardly ever used as rocket fuel. I suppose we should use something more realistic. I decided to replace aniline with something more flammable, for example, unsymmetrical dimethylhydrazine, also known as heptyl. Do not ask where I bought it. This substance is extremely dangerous, so it is better not to repeat the following experiments. In addition to its high flammability, heptyl is also extremely toxic and carcinogenic, which is why I conduct experiments with it while wearing thick gloves and a respirator. To create a model of an amyl heptyl rocket engine, I again pour some nitrogen oxide mixture into a test tube, after which I add some heptyl to it. Interestingly, this substance ignites even when it comes in contact with nitrogen dioxide vapors, and then gets inside the test tube where it burns much faster than aniline. And I decided to continue the experiments using them. That was a mistake that I later regretted. Besides, heptyl easily boils, hence constantly spilled and boiled out of the pipette. During one of the experiments, some heptyl dripped onto the background, but I didn't pay much attention to it. However, a few seconds later, the paper caught fire. Afterward, it ignited the alcohol, which had accumulated in a tray and cooled with nitrogen oxides. This is where the story about the fire in my laboratory begins. After the ignition of the alcohol, the lab was full of smoke and I had no time to extinguish it. Luckily, I managed to pull the glass with two liters of alcohol on the floor so that it wouldn't catch fire, and then I ran outside. You've probably already seen the consequences in the previous video. I advise you not to conduct experiments with one of the most dangerous propellants. Well, I believe after watching this video, you've learned what happens if you buy heptyl and start experimenting with it near flammable objects. Now I'm still dealing with the consequences of the fire, and all the details are published in my telegram. So follow the link in the description. If you want to help me with the creation of a new laboratory, Links to donate are also in the description. Thank you. And if you enjoyed this video, as always, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe to the channel to see many more new and interesting things.